This is a supplement, supplementary video about the end of the American Revolution. The American Revolution started in 1775 and continued through the year 1781 with real fighting. The revolution itself does not come till an, to an end until 1783 with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. But from effectively 1778 until the end of the war, those often were dark years. Occasionally you will have victories and battles and such. Uh, you'll have the, uh, the altering victory, the course altering victory of the war at Saratoga. Uh, but with the exceptions of Saratoga and a few other small affairs, oftentimes it seemed like the American Revolution was, uh, more of a misses, a, a, a story of misses and near misses rather than outstanding victories. You'll have a victory here or a victory there, but, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, it seems like the American Revolution is just holding on for dear life. And in a sense, perhaps, that was the working out of that American strategy. Uh, in the beginning of the American Revolution, the general strategy by Washington and his staff was is that they needed to fight and to whip the British. But after about 1776, with those dark days and dark years, the strategy starts to change from we need to win battles and win the war to we need to pick our battles, win them when we pick them, and when we uh, win those battles, perhaps we can string the war out long enough that the British get tired of fighting us. It's a good strategy and ultimately helps bring the war to a successful and fruitful conclusion. But here today we pick up uh, our lecture on the with the life and times of uh, one Benedict Arnold. Uh, Benedict Arnold, as we've already met, has uh, been an important character in the American Revolution. Uh, Arnold uh, was wounded and was left for de uh, seemingly left for dead outside of Montreal, but uh, he survives and lives to fight another day. You're going to find his fingerprints all over upstate New York and present-day Vermont in and around Lake Champlain. You're going to see him working and doing and, and being diligent uh, in his efforts in trying to uh, uh, bring about victory. And as we also know, too, is, is that Arnold is a sort of man uh, who doesn't play well with others. He is a, a strange character. I've explained it more in, in previous lectures. Uh, but that man uh, always felt like he had been ignored and not taken, uh, given full credit of what he was due as an American commander. So that brings us to what Mar uh, Benedict Arnold is known for. And in American English, he is synonymous with the phrase of treason. Benedict Arnold was a little younger than I am when he commits his treason. I'm 41 as I shoot this video. Uh, he was about 36 or 37. Benedict Arnold is, uh, is gonna have the seeds of treason already there. And then he meets his wife, uh, his second wife, Peggy, and that helps us uh, spin him into his infamous, uh, future. After his wounding at Saratoga, and it was a grisly sort, uh, as you may recall, he's going to have a leg that's about two inches shorter uh, than his other because of that, that thigh wound that shattered part of his femur uh, there at Saratoga. Uh, he'll recover, but it, perhaps you could say he's never quite the same again. Arnold, however, will be uh, given command. He's uh, going to be always the sort of man who, re who uh, recovers quickly, Arnold, however, when he recovers, is uh, going to be given command of the military governorship there in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the capital city of the American colonies, and uh, it has been at times occupied by the British. But for the most part, it has been kept in American hands. Arnold, while he's there, he uh, goes to uh, various balls and to various events. And it's also worth noting, too, that Arnold is uh, a very prominent and uh, a very uh, sociable sort of man. Arnold is, a, when he wants to be, a likable guy. And also is a bit of a braggart. He's a bit of a show-off. For example, the uniforms that the uh, officers wore in this time period, uh, they, especially American officers, they wore a close-fitting sort of uniform uh, that left very little to the imagination. And Arnold would sit at these uh, events, uh, these balls in Philadelphia, and he would be there with that, uh, uh, not withered, but that mangled leg, and he would have that thing propped up because he had to, and some of it had to do because he wanted to, but he'd have that leg propped up so all could see that he had served his nation and he had, been, he had bled for his nation. Other men of, uh, I would argue, higher quality and higher character uh, might uh, hide that wound just a little bit, but not Larnell. He is a braggart, and he wants to show off everybody, every, to everyone who will see that he too had blood for the nation and that he deserved more. 
Uh, but while he is governor there in Philadelphia, he's going to come across a set of loyalist uh, individuals. They're known as the Shippens, S-H-I-P-P-E-N. Uh, they've got a vivacious, young, and attractive daughter named Peggy, and she's about 18 years old. If you look at the life of Arnold, he tended to like his uh, his wives uh, a little youngish. But anyways, uh, the fact was is that Peggy and uh, their, her family were all loyalists uh, to the crown of England. And Peggy and uh, and Arnold, Benedict Arnold, become a item and eventually will marry. Now you can imagine what type of scandal and what type of gossip uh, is going to be spewed forth uh, by waggish individuals and <laughs> just simply people with a, a set of eyes on them could say, what on earth is this American general doing thinking about uh, crawling into uh, bed, so to speak, literally and figuratively, I suppose, with this loyalist? Is it a recipe for disaster? Uh, yes, of course it is. Uh, Peggy is not the person who's going to cause the uh, the tre treachery and treason, but if this is a garden analogy, the ground was already tilled, the seed was already planted, and Peggy helped water it and fertilize it and bring it up. But ultimately, it's going to be Arnold who's going to do it. And so, uh, as time goes along, it's worth remembering that Benedict Arnold's relationship with George Washington is actually a, quite a good one. Uh, Washington thinks very highly of Arnold and thinks of him to the point where uh, he wants Arnold in the field to be fighting and leading troops once more. It was Washington at times who will fight for Arnold and on Arnold's behalf with the Continental Congress. The Continental Congress had at times uh, given Arnold the shaft with regard to uh, their, his uh, ad advancements and his promotions, but oftentimes, however, Arnold was sometimes his worst, own worst enemy. But by the time we get to about uh, seven, late 1779, say the fall of 79, Arnold is going to conceive of and does, uh, start to put feelers into the uh, waters, as it were, to put feelers out with the British about uh, switching sides to uh, uh, betraying his friends and his cause. The British are interested in Arnold, but they're not, uh, not every British officer is convinced that Arnold is as big of a catch as Arnold thinks he is. Most British officers tended to think Arnold was the best officer in the American Revolution for the Americans. That, that was, I don't know if it was universal, but it was certainly uh, held belief by multiple uh, individuals. However, uh, what are you going to pay for it and what do you want? Now, Arnold is going to want money. He's going to want money. He's going to want a lot of it. In fact, actually, his initial asking price was 20,000 pounds sterling. That is a gargantuan amount. It's the equivalent of winning a very nice lottery, millions of dollars in the lottery. So Arnold uh, is not going to ask for a little bit in addition to the money. He also wants a command of troops. He wants to be have a commission in the British Army, and he wants to be somebody. Ultimately, Arnold uh, uh, craves glory probably more than anything else. He craves reputation and, hi and history, and in a sense, he gets it, I guess. Uh, but he gets it for all the wrong reasons. But before the British are going to give over uh, all that money, or they're going to give something, that's, that's clear. But to give that princely sum of 20,000 pounds sterling, they, they are going to demand basically two things of Arnold. Number one, you have to give us West Point, New York on the Hudson River. Number two, you have to or try to get us George Washington either dead or alive. One or both of those, uh, those gifts would guarantee Arnold his uh, princely sum and his position without any question. Well, Arnold, uh, in order to pay off uh, for the British in this great uh, de deception, Arnold is going to be approached by Washington in 1779 about taking command in the field once more. Arnold swears off and says, I'm not that, I'm not feeling great. My leg's still not just right. Uh, but Arnold does offer, and Washington is unaware, of course, Arnold offers to take command of the forts at West Point, New York. Some of you watching this video may have been to West Point, New York already. Maybe you went on a visit to go see uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. That is where uh, the, if you watch sports, the Army plays. Uh, that is West Point, to use a little shorthand. Uh, but the academy is built basically on the old fortifications or around the old fortifications there at the bend in the west in the Hudson River. If you were to look at a map of the Hudson River right there, it has about a two-way, it's got about a dog leg, 90 degree angles in it, that if you can command those heights and command the waters right there in that turn in the river, you can block the river up. 
And as you may recall, the Hudson River has been a, a strategic point and a strategic design and desire of the British since uh, at least 1776 and arguably before that. In fact, actually both sides can read the map and say if you wanted to cut uh, the colonies in two, you would you, try to get the Hudson River Valley and the Hudson River in your possession. If you want to invade Canada, if you go back early enough, you go up the Hudson through Lake Champlain and head into Montreal. Uh, it is, in a sense, a natural thoroughfare uh, for military operations in the New York State region. And so uh, the British, once again, want that fortification. It's the most important fortification on the whole, si on the whole setup. So in June of 1780, Washington had uh, given in to Arnold's uh, requests. Uh, again, Washington trusts Arnold. Washington likes Arnold. He's one of the few. Washington thinks he's one of the best men he's got. And Washington reluctantly gives Arnold the command at West Point because Arnold uh, had begged him for it. And then in June of 1780, Arnold received word from Washington and his staff that, uh, that Washington, Alexander Hamilton, who's the chief of staff, uh, writer, conniver, a half dozen other things, Henry Knox, uh, James McHenry, and a few other individuals are going to be passing through Pickskill, New York, which is right down river from West Point. Uh, and they were going to need to stop over, and they, Washington wanted to confer with Superintendent Arnold about West Point and the defenses. Washington was headed to Hartford, Connecticut to meet with Comte de Rochamb the Comte de Rochambeau uh, of uh, the French Navy and, uh, and French armies as well uh, regarding what the grand strategy was for the upcoming year or so. So Washington was passing through. It's uh, not, I, don't I don't get the impression it was complete and total secrecy, but I do get the impression it was not exactly a broadcast event. So Arnold organizes a p dinner party at this house of some friends of his. Uh, they were patriots. They were unknown of what's going on. But they were uh, organizing a party uh, for uh, Washington to have dinner. And Arnold, in order to pull the great uh, betrayal off, is going to alert his British friends to Washington's presence. Then, as the story or the plans had, is that Washington would be sitting at dinner along with his staff, along with others, along with Arnold, and the British would send in dragoons, and they would walk, they'd march in, either capture or kill Washington. And in a sense, as I said at the outset of this, these lectures on the American Revolution, if you got those, uh, if you got Washington, you got the American army, you got the war, and it was over because uh, the Washington by this point in time is going to mean so much to the war effort. Well, it didn't go off as Arnold had planned. Washington had a great evening, spent the night evidently, as I understand the story, and then passed on the next morning to Hartford and Arnold. You can only imagine the tension in the room while he's waiting for the dragoons to show up. Well, we can fast forward now to September of uh, 1780, September 20th. Washington is uh, passing back through, his, uh, through, through Peekskill and the H Hudson River Valley. Again, he's looking to meet with Arnold uh, for further consultation. And Arnold, at this point in time, is ready to give over West Point to the British. He had made deals as such. And uh, when Wa Arnold, what he does is he alerts his British uh, interlopers uh, in, for them to be ready to take West Point. He's ready to give it over. The man who Arnold is going to deal with is a guy named John Andre. Uh, the accent over the E. Uh, Andre is the intermediary between New York City, the British High Command, and Arnold at West Point. And Andre was carrying papers and such, and he was uh, going to seal up the deal and cinch it up in a bag, as it were, uh, to make arrangements to bring the British up to uh, uh, West Point and to take that uh, fortification. When Andre was stopped, and this is about September 23rd, Andre is stopped outside of West Point by some pickets, by some security guards, if you want to use that term. So Arnold, uh, I mean, Andre is going to be stopped, and for whatever reason, just maybe the nerves of the situation, never underestimate human ability to crack in pressure, uh, Andre got nervous and he blurted out to these pickets, whom he supposed to be loyalists, he blurted out what he was up to. And these pickets were not loyalists, but patriots. And so what they ended up doing was arresting Andre. Well, they took Andre to uh, Arnold and said, look what we've got. But these pickets had also picked Andre's clothing. And they had picked through it and they held back from Arnold the, the papers that incriminated Arnold in this whole plot. But Arnold's no fool. 
when Andre was picked up, he knew who Andre was. He knew what the game was that the game was up, and so Andre uh, Arnold on September 25th is going to mount up on a horse and ride south and ride in New York City into the lines, into the British lines for safety. About 18 or 24 hours later, George Washington himself with his staff show up, and they, these pickets, give Washington this piece of paper, these papers, showing Andre was the courier between Arnold and his British uh, uh, betrayer, uh, uh, friends, say it like that, I guess. Washington reads it. He recognizes the papers for what they really were, and Washington is crestfallen. And Washington said it uh, very memorably, he said, if Arnold has betrayed us, whom can we trust? Washington was maddened. In fact, he was enraged by Arnold's betrayal. Washington did almost everything he could to murder Arnold. He wanted Arnold, and to say it differently, he wanted Arnold to swing from the gibbets. He wanted him to basically be hung. Arnold Washington will go so far as to send one of his crack troops, may not a, a squad, but as an individual, to infiltrate Arnold's army and try to join the British army and then capture or kill Arnold for, on behalf of Washington. Arnold uh, gets away, but Peggy, who had been staying at West Point, uh, she, who was aware of this whole situation, she was confronted by Washington, and Washington was, uh, you could say, probably a bit naive. And he wanted to believe that Peggy uh, was uh, was not a player. She was unaware. He wanted to believe that she was, uh, quote-unquote, the fairer sex, I guess. And uh, they asked her, said, Peggy, did you know anything about this? And Peggy's answer was basically, uh, no, I didn't. And uh, you could almost imagine, and I think there were some tears, histrionics, uh, uh, not unlike perhaps uh, you hear about people uh, crying when they get pulled over by the DPS. So that sort of thing goes on in Washington and, and the staff believe Peggy. And then a few minute, hours later when Washington and the staff are gone, or at least they have their back turned, Peggy mounts up and rides out to New York City to be with her husband. Well, the rest of the story uh, with regard to uh, Washington, Arnold, and, and uh, the, rest, the rest of the war is Arnold will uh, put on a British uniform. He'll, he will be in the field. And for a while, uh, he is uh, effective in the war. However, he was never trusted, and I think that's an important thing to remember. The British never really trust Arnold. He's a rat. He's a Judas. He's a betrayer. So Arnold, after the war is over, can't live in the United States. This is not one of those let bygones be bygone situations. So Arnold moves to England when the revolution comes to a successful completion and conclusion for the Americans. And so Arnold moves to London. And there he becomes an outcast in society. I know General Washington wanted to have him hung, but perhaps in a sense, considering what Arnold was up to and how much he craved glory and uh, position and power and influence, the fact that he spent the next uh, the rest of his life, and I think it was about 30 years, uh, more or less in obscurity and uh, derision and he's ostracized, that might have been the best punishment for a man like Benedict Arnold. So that's the story of Arnold's uh, of ratting out. But the American Revolution, in a sense, is going to come to a, a, swift, a swifter end now, uh, and it's going to happen down south. By the time you get to 1780, the Americans, uh, or rather the British, are going to come to the conclusion that perhaps there is opportunity to be had down south, in South Carolina and Georgia and perhaps North Carolina. We could, they, thinking from the British perspective, they could split away those colonies and defeat them and then cripple the war effort there. What it ends up doing is it only stirs up the pot of South Carolina and some of the nastiest, most brutal fighting of the entire war is found in that part of, of uh, Carol the Carolinas. Uh, in fact, actually, as I may have said to you before about the, the uh, movie by Mel Gibson, The Patriot, that is loosely based off of the fighting that uh, we're now taking up in the 1780 and 81 time period. Uh, one of the main characters down there who Arnold uh, is fighting against, not Arnold, excuse me, Kirk that uh, the Americans are fighting against is a commander called Bannister Tarleton. 
the American commanders, Daniel Morgan, and then more especially the overall commander, Nathan Nathaniel Green, also known as the Fighting Quaker, are going to uh, get into the combat operations in the Carolinas and are going to win or cause uh, or lose uh, several major battles. Cal Pins, a major victory for the Americans led by Daniel Morgan against Bannister Tarleton and others, and then later the Battle of Kil Guilford Courthouse, uh, which was really, you could call uh, for your notes, a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, but in a uh, pyrrhic victory for the British, the British commander uh, at Guilford Courthouse is a fellow named Cornwallis, Lord Cornwallis. Well, the British won so, uh, lost so many troops, yet won the battle, they had to fall back. And they fell back to the York Peninsula there in South Virginia. And on the York Peninsula, they get bottled up. This large British army is bottled up on the York Peninsula by the American and French forces led by Washington and others. But that whole peninsula campaign from October, excuse me, August to October of 1781 uh, is uh, emblematical uh, and is uh, is only going to be made supported. It's, ah, shoot, I can't talk now. Okay, is only going to be made possible by a French naval flotilla that defeats the British flotilla off of the coast of Virginia, off of the Chesapeake Bay's mouth. When the French are able to seal off the waters there uh, at the York Peninsula, they, the waters of the Chesapeake, that's when that siege becomes a maximum uh, hammer upon those British soldiers, and they eventually surrender in October 1781. Could the British have kept fighting? Sure, they had troops to command, they had opportunity to do so. But after October 1781, for all intents and purposes for this class, the American Revolution comes to an end. It comes to an end because the uh, the British people and the British government, more especially, lose their will to fight. No longer are they uh, willing to spend blood, treasure, and time trying to keep the American colonies home. They finally give up and say, fine, you can have your freedom, and so forth. And it comes about in the Treaty of 1783. We Americans, and you can read more about this in your textbook, and I would encourage you to do so, but we Americans, under the direction of our chief diplomat in, the, in this treaty uh, negotiations of uh, Benjamin Franklin and others, but especially Franklin, they double-crossed the French. The French had agreed to help us out as long as we agreed to negotiate a successful peace treaty alongside of the French and the British, and it was all at the trilateral or quadrilateral talks. That was going nowhere, but Franklin on a, I won't say a whim, but Franklin on a, uh, on a design is going to set out and uh, basically approach the British and say, let's settle this thing. Independence, boundaries, and, uh, and fishing rights, and uh, promises uh, not to persecute loyalists to help them get out and so forth. You can put, into your, uh, you can put it like that. Your boundary is going to be set basically at the west, uh, at the Mississippi River, at the north, uh, at the Great Lakes. The South at Florida, Florida is not a part of the U.S. at this point in time, and on we can go. And so the American independence uh, is guaranteed in 1783 by the Treaty of Paris. There are going to be 13, mark it down, 13 peace treaties signed, one for each colony giving them their independence. So perhaps you could even think a little bit that perhaps those colonies, now states, uh, could predate the American government. Well, that's, uh, that's a, a brief snippet of the close of the war. I think it's also worth noting for our last few minutes of uh, this lecture the importance of George Washington. As I've stated before to you, George Washington is not the greatest general in the history of America or, any, or the world, uh, at least in the battlefield and especially early on. He makes some mistakes, maybe perhaps makes a lot of mistakes that should not have been made. Uh, I grant him great credit for figuring out that you don't win the war, you, don't, you just don't have to lose it. But I think where Washington's greatest contributions as a general it happened here in 1783. Uh, it's on twofold. Number one, it's at, uh, in Newburgh, New York, at a place, uh, what's called Newburgh, in the event, the Newburgh Conspiracy. The American army had been poorly trained and poorly uh, handled by the Continental Congress. Frankly, the Continental Congress was a shabby institution by 1783. It's worth remembering that the Continental Congress is made up of second string and third-rate zeros, no bodies and never will be's. 
the American Continental Congress is nothing compared to what it had been in 1775 with the Jeffersons and Franklins and Adamses and so on. All those men are gone for the most part. You have a bunch of nobodies in the Congress now. But over its history during the war, it had not paid the troops well. In fact, it hadn't paid them at all at times. Men were being owed uh, months and years of salary. Some folks, some men really never got paid at all throughout the war, yet they fought on without ever being paid. They weren't wealthy like Washington, who could afford to decline a salary. But these officers, many of them, could not afford such a thing. But they stuck it out in true patriotic fashion. But now, in 1783, they are looking for their just resorts. They are looking for their just reward. And so, when you talk about uh, Wash the uh, Newburgh conspiracy, what you have is a cabal, C-A-B-A-L, a cabal of officers who are going to demand from the government a pension for life plus land and various and other uh, sundry other sweeteners for their needs. The Newburgh conspiracy basically says this, and th that was the demand, but now you have to have the hammer. This is the closest the United States has ever come to having a dictatorship by the military. Uh, it's here at Newburgh, and this is where Washington shines his greatest, uh, potentially. The officers had uh, arranged for a meeting at the Newburgh uh, Temple. I call it the Temple of Wisdom. It's really kind of like a dance hall, but it's a big open uh, uh, meeting hall. And the officer corps, the entire officer corps of the Continental Army there at Newburgh meet. And they were to discuss what they were going to do next, this Newburgh petition. But there had already been warnings to the Congress that if the uh, Congress did not pay up, well, if the British came back and the treaty was not, by the way, signed, sealed, and delivered yet, but if the treaty, the British came back, the American Continental Army, if ordered into the field to fight the British once more, they would refuse to go. If the treaty was signed and the men were not given their pension and their pay, then the British, then the army, when it was ordered to disband, would not go home. This is a violation of civilian control of the military. This is the army threatening to become a dictator to the civilian government. These are extraordinarily important and portentous moments in history, our history. If this is handled differently or wrongly, Katie bar the door, this could be a horrible, horrible affair. When the officers met there at that dance hall and the situation gets underway, uh, General Horatio Gates opens the meeting, and shortly, in the span of a couple of minutes after the meeting opens, uh, uninvited, walks in George Washington with his staff. Washington, wearing his finest dress uniform, steps before his men and gives an impassioned address. And it goes nowhere. It is a complete bomb. It completely fails. It is a, it, it doesn't do anything. The men are hard, and he notices it. Washington was a lot of things. He was a great commander, a great American, and I think a great actor. He was not a great public speaker, but he was an actor, and he knew how to play the part when he had to. He noticed as he gave that speech that the men were not moved by it. They were not moved by the oratory. And so what Washington does is he changes gears for the drama. Washington says to his men, he says, Men, you will permit me to read a letter from, the, uh, this, from this congressman. It will help you understand the predicament they're in, and this is some remedies for you. And so Washington reaches into his coat and pulls out this uh, letter. Slowly and dramatically, he opens the letter. Catch, and, of course, the people's attention, the men's attention is drawn to that letter. Then Washington fumbles with it, and he tries to read it. He starts into the letter, and it's obvious he's having trouble. He's fumbling the words, and that gains the men's attention all the more. And then Washington, dramatically, again, not overly such, this is not vaudeville, but he does reach back into his pocket, and he pulls out a set of glasses. And when he pulls out these set of glasses, his men are dumbfounded. The only folks who had ever seen him wear glasses were in his immediate staff, like an Alexander Hamilton or Henry Knox or those men right in the inner circle of George Washington and his military family, as he called it. His rank officers, his normal uh, rank-and-file officers, had never seen this before. And Washington holds these glasses up, and he looks at his men, and he says, You will permit me a moment to put on my glasses. I have not only grown gray, but nearly blind. 
in the service of my country. And it was at that moment when Washington, whom had led these men, some of them the entire war, he'd fought with them, men who respected and loved Washington in, in their own way. It, it, the men broke and cried. They were ashamed, to use an old phrase. They were ashamed of what they had considered and that Washington, he too had been hurt by the war. He was not the marble man. He was not a god, small g. He was a man and he too was normal. And it, it broke the conspiracy. And Washington, in a sense, you can maybe argue, I think you can argue this, and I will, is, is that Washington saves the American Revolution, in a sense, right there, from going into a civil war. Because if you know your history, and some of you watching this really do, uh, civil wars often follow revolutions because there is no great man, or the great man fails, or the great man becomes a tyrant, or tries to become a tyrant, and the factions descend to uh, trying to fill the power vacuum of the departed, in this case, British government. There was no civil war that follows the American Revolution, and that is a testimony to George Washington. The last thing I'll bring up to you before I go in, uh, uh, in the video is this. Washington in, oh, let me look at my note here just a second. Washington in, uh, oh, what was it, uh, the 23rd of December, on the 23rd of December, 1783, the treaty is signed, sealed, and delivered. The British are starting to pick up and pack up. Washington is going to do what he longed to do for years and years, and that is go home. So Washington goes to Annapolis, Maryland, where the Continental Congress had been stationed and had taken up shop. And there, at high noon, on 23rd of December, 1783, Washington walks before this this body of Congress, this less than important body of Congress, these men of shabby backgrounds for the most part, and he walks before them and he resigns his commission. That is an important concept as well. And this, like at Newburgh, is Washington's greatest moments, and I think where he is really a great man. Most men who are the heroes of revolutions are not going to resign their commission. Most men who are, uh, who are military chieftains like Washington was are going to hold on to their power. Washington resigns his commission, and more especially, this is worth noting, he resigns it to the Continental Congress, not to the people, not to heaven, not to anybody except the Continental Congress that gave it to him. The Congress that now was shabby, but he gave it back to them. Washington resigns and he goes back to Mount Vernon, a la Cincinnati, that Roman general. Napoleon would never have done that. He didn't do that. Santana of Mexico did not do that, and the list is long. This is probably where you could say the civilian control, the military, subordination, the uh, man is no man is indispensable, however you want to express it. These are some bedrock principles of the American government and the American constitutional order that are being laid right here. And I think this if it may not be that Washington was the greatest man in the on the battlefield, but he was the greatest man in his conduct at the end of the war crushing the Newburgh conspiracy and resigning his uh, commission to the Congress that gave it to him. And that brings us to a close of the American Revolution. Thank you.